I want to begin a brand new series of messages today. And I'm going to, um, for the sake of time, just read one, one text. Um, so media team, I'm not going to read as many as I did uh, last service because I just ran out of time and uh, I'm already not wanting to do that. So Mark chapter 16 is where I want to begin reading. Mark chapter 16, and today we begin a brand new series called Go. Everybody say go. go. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a goer. Yeah. Turn to somebody else and say, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Um, th- this is, um, this two letter word is a directive from God and it's not just a call to action, but it's a call, ladies and gentlemen, to transformation. That as we obey this directive, we're changed and transformed in the process. It's a two letter simple word that is a complete sentence. And we've all heard it, or at least a lot of us have heard this passage that I'm going to read. And whenever I read from a familiar text, it always makes me nervous. It makes me nervous because um, the idea that you've already heard that or you already know that can prevent you from learning what you need to learn next about what Jesus has said. And so I want you to um, kind of, as I read this text, uh, listen, but then I want to share some things and make this as practical as I can. This is the final thing that Jesus says before he ascends to heaven in the Gospels. And he gives a directive, and um, he's giving a directive not only to those disciples of that day, but any of the disciples that would result from the preaching of the good news. So, if you're a follower of Jesus, these red words are Jesus speaking to you. Verse 15, and he, Jesus, said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they, the sick, will recover. This passage shows us that Jesus' call to go was not just, as I said, for his original disciples, but it's for everyone in this room who calls Jesus the Lord of their life. However, over the last 20 years, I've learned that this simple two-letter word can be daunting for us as humans. And I want to dive into why going is easier said than done. And I want to use as an example Moses' life in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. Because this is a a going passage. This is a commissioning passage. And here is what Exodus 3.10 says. This is the time in which Moses is given the directive to go and set the children of Israel free from the captivity of Pharaoh. Not a small assignment. Go, let my, go and he says, tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. Um, And this is where he gets that instruction in verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, God, I will certainly be with you and this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. <clears throat> Interesting dialogue as you follow along with 
Moses and God, as God tells Moses what his step is. And what I want to bring out for us today are some of the objections that Moses gave to God, because many of you maybe would be sitting there, you know the end, whenever you know the end of the story, you think the obedience is simple. You know the end of the story that Moses relinquishes control of the Israelites, and you think because you know that's the end that Moses knew that end. But Moses is no more privy to the end of his story as you are privy to the end of yours. Both of us, you and I and him, we're all walking by faith. You don't know the end. You really just don't know. You may have a good idea. You may think you have a solid guess. You may think that you've set up a certain plan and trajectory to make sure you end at a certain place. But at the end of the day, you really don't know the specifics. And so because you've seen the movie and because you've seen Charlton Heston with his staff saying, let my people go and Moses gets his way and God wins, you think it was easy. But this is really a disagreement between Moses and God. It is a dialogue and a discussion about all of the concerns, fears, and all the trepidation that Moses has about this being sent. And I bring it out to us today because I think there, I know there are three things that Moses wrestled with, that I wrestled with, and I believe that everyone in this room wrestles with in the idea when Jesus says, go into all the world. No one who's been a believer for a very long time is confused about that verse and what it means. Right? It's, it's I mean, it, it means what it means. It means go into all, it means you leave and go and do something. The thought of that brings such fear to people for so many different reasons, and I want to give you three of those reasons that Moses has. Number one, Moses had the feeling of inadequacy and insecurity, and everyone in this room feels that, and here's where it's expressed in verse 11. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? Why me? What are my qualifications? What's so important about me? There's a whole lot of other people on this blue marble planet that you could have chosen. Why me? I think you could have found somebody better. I think you could have found somebody more equipped. I think you could have picked somebody who doesn't have such a checkered past. I think you could have picked someone who is all of the things that you and I fill in the blank on when we think about taking those steps. Now, before we get too far into this, listen to me very carefully. Do not think about what I'm doing. Meaning, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I'm not asking you to preach a message, although that might be in your future. I'm not giving that pressure. I'm not saying that you need to be a prayer. I'm not saying you need to do all of the things that you've marked up in your mind as is spiritual. I'm not telling you that in order to go that you have to be a person on this platform worshiping. I'm not telling you that you have to lead a team or a group. I'm not telling you that you have to do anything that you've set in your mind that is connected to the organization of who we are or who any church is is what I'm asking you to measure this against is what needs do you see and what needs are followed by a desire to fill them. If you need to write that down, those are the key things. You see a need and then you have a desire to fill it. That is a massive uh, indicator of what God has planted in your life to go and to do. This, this, this uh, last weekend, uh, before the weekend, many of you know that Frasiesburg, a, a town to, to our east, um, a portion of it was really devastated by um, portions of it by, by a, a, a tornado. And um, I sent, I sent uh, Steve a message and I said, hey, do we have anyone that would be a good candidate for some disaster relief? And he said, he sent a text back and he said, no, uh, not at the moment, but we're, but we're looking. And within an hour, um, a young lady in our church named Cassie Graham, she sent me a, this really, me and a couple other people in a group text, this really long, well, lengthy text. How many of you know lengthy texts can be really nerve wracking? 
And he, am I the only one that like sees like a whole, like, like if you got a slide, if you got a slide to read the whole communication, it's either really, really good or really, really bad and there's no other choices. And so it was a fairly lengthy one and I know Cassie and I'm like, okay, so she, she, she's saying, here's what she's saying in the text. I see a need in Frasiesburg and I have a desire to meet that need. And so I call her and I say, hey, do you wanna be the point person for the disaster relief? She said, absolutely I do. I've carved out time, I have time off. This is what I want to do. What did she do? She did Mark chapter 16. She was a goer. And there were dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of other goers. And I went for a little bit before we had the men's breakfast. So uh, Angie and I were goers. And they had an assembly line, and, and um, I got to the end of the assembly line, and I was the, they were making breakfast burritos, and I was wrapping burritos. And it was really cool to wrap burritos, because there was a guy that I knew there, he said, wow, you do have an employable skill after all. <laughs> I'm a good burrito wrapper, baby. I didn't even know it. Like, Josh has a system, and he's wrapping, and he's wrapping, and it was like, it was too, it was too, it was two lines, but there was, I was the only rapper, not, not <laughs> like W-R-A-P-P-R. Like, and and why am I telling you that? Because I was just doing, I didn't even, can I be honest with you? Yeah. When that happened, I was like, I felt like, oh man, I, I, I feel bad for them. But I kind of have a lot of things that are in my mind, desire that I have other needs. And I'm like, I, I really don't have that time to spearhead that. I can go and give an hour and 15 minutes and help, and while I'm wrapping the burritos, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but while I'm wrapping the burritos, word comes back that not everyone is taking the food. And kind of the room kind of was a little discouraged. And a um, wonderful lady spoke up and she said, who wouldn't take a free breakfast? And without thinking, I said, people who aren't hungry. Why am I saying that to you? Because Jesus says in your going, right in the beginning, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes will be saved and he that believeth not will be condemned. What point am I making to you there? It isn't your job to make them eat the burrito. It's your job to wrap it and go. Their response is up to them. What, at the end of the, I'll jump to the end, in, in, uh, the th I'll just give you the three things, I don't need to be this big reveal, inadequacy and insecurity, lack of knowledge, and fear of rejection are the three things that Moses talks to God about in that passage. He feels insecure, he doesn't know all the steps, and he's afraid, well what if they don't accept me, what if they reject me and who I am? Listen, oftentimes we don't go and try to fill the need that we have a desire to fill because we're afraid they will reject us. And I want you to understand, here's the truth, they will reject you. But in so doing, they're rejecting someone way more important than you. They're rejecting the one who sent you. And every time I feel rejected, I always find solace in understanding, wait a minute, this is not about me. This is about the one I represent. And my job is to go, and that is the end of my assignment. That in going, that's where all the strength comes. That's where all the power comes. That's where all the help comes is that I go. So he had these feelings like you and I do of inadequacy and insecurity, a lack of knowledge. You know, what are, the, what are they supposed to call you? Can I, can I just tell you this, please? That when you go, you won't know the end until you get to the end. You'll see one small step. And that small step is usually what prevents people from going. I don't understand it. Some of us are wired to where we need the entire plan. 
We need the entire blueprint. We need the entire schematic. Where do we go? What time are we supposed to get there? How long is it supposed to last? What color is every gonna be, everybody going to be wearing? What are they serving? How long is it going to take? Does anybody want to go with me? Will anybody else show up? Are they going to be nice? What's their name going to be? When's their birth date? Do we have the same zodiac sign? What's going on with all... And question after question after question that people use as an excuse to not move. And usually those questions aren't really all that important in the final analysis. I believe in organization. I believe in planning and thinking through things. But can I tell you a secret? That when you, when you make a plan, it almost never goes according to plan, whatever it is that you plan. Do you know that the plan is not the thing? The thing is the thing. And you're like, oh, well, this part of the plan didn't work, and so you, you, have, it, you have it as falling apart. People not taking a burrito did not upend my day. You know what I was celebrating? That like six to 800 people did take the burritos. What, what, what is it about the human mind that gets locked into, you look around in a room and you, you realize where was so-and-so and you forget the 1,200 people who were there. Well, so-and-so wasn't here today or so-and-so wasn't there and you feel like, no, 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 no. What about, what about the people who you did help? What about if just, what about if you see a need and fill it and 83,000 people say no, but two people who really mean it say yes. There you go. Then what? Like, this is, this is the stuff that, that keeps us back. This, this fear and this insecurity, this inadequacy, this, this lack of knowledge, and um, the fear of rejection or failure is a powerful deterrent. It's why some people haven't already said yes to go projects that you have in your mind and your heart. It's the reason why people in our church haven't left after a service and gone across the hall or gone online and said, hey, I want to do this. It's the reason why people haven't signed up to be volunteers in a certain area of ministry. It's the reason why some people haven't gone to outreach and walk the streets. It's the, it's the reason why somebody hasn't gone into the kitchen because there's just all these things that you don't know. Can I just tell you something? The, the lack of knowledge won't kill you. Because even when you fill your head with all the stuff, there's still going to be stuff you don't know. Had I known all that entailed and would be in front of me when I said yes to us starting this church, I'd have said no. If I would have, if I would have known all the things that were my responsibility once I became a husband to my wonderful wife, who is amazing, who is amazing, it's, it's, not, it's not her fault, it's just... It's, Husbands and wives have tough jobs. If I would have known all that was involved in that, I'd been like, oh, maybe I should pray about this a little bit longer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like the story, this is sexist, but I'm gonna tell it anyway, I don't care. Um, it's just not slightly, it's just a tiny bit sexist. It's like the man who was talking to God and God said, I'll give you anything you want, just ask me. He says, you know, I, I, what I really would like is, I'd like to go to Hawaii, but I hate flying. Could you, could you build me a bridge? And the Lord said, man, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big request. Is, uh, is there anything else I can do for you? He said, yeah, I'd really like to understand my wife. And God said, would you like that bridge two lanes or four? <laughs> if, you know, if you know all this stuff ahead of time, let's talk about kids. How many have kids? How many have grandkids? If I'd have known everything there was to know about kids... I'd have been a little more calculated in how many we had. Because <laughs> my stupid self thought when they get older, they get cheaper. I just got to bide my time. I was like, well, that was dumb. We just came back from vacation with nine of us. I'm like, well, dear Lord, that's crazy. I don't know who's in charge of this, but somebody's got to do something about the price of food and groceries in this country. Somebody's got to do something. <laughs> This is basic. I mean, we believe, like we believe God, I believe all my needs are going to be met, but my Lord, 
if you know all that's involved, right? You're not gonna know all that's involved in going. Some things are gonna be good, and I'm just here to tell you, some things are gonna be bad. Some people are gonna say yes, some people are gonna say no. Some of your ideas are gonna be good ones, some of your ideas are gonna be bad. And that's what a church is here to tell, help you understand. What's a good idea and what's a bad idea? That's a bad idea. Don't do that. Or it's pretty narrow, don't be discouraged when your main interest is medieval drawbridge architecture that half a person shows up for your small group. Don't get upset about that. <laughs> like, Daniel's gonna come and help me, I'm way out of time. I wanna, I wanna draw your attention to something. Back in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, the very first sign that will follow the believer is this. I didn't write this. I'm just telling you what God has said. And these signs will follow them that believe. And in context, church, these signs will follow them that believe and those who go. These signs are given as people go. That's what we saw with Moses. There will be signs given, but not while you're sitting in the safety and comfort of your living room. Not while you're on the backside of the wilderness, Moses, as you go. Go. Why? Because you in that living room, you don't need that sign. You already got all the direction you need. The two-letter word go. These signs will follow them that believe. And watch this. The first one is this. In my name, they will cast out demons. Now, this is a very real thing. Um, right here is Mr. Martin. Um, he and I went to Guyana 25 years ago as a first-year student, and he was a second-year student. And he'll remember this. Well, we were, we were going up and down the river picking people up for a crusade. And um, this one night, this, this lady got on the boat next to me. And I was uncomfortable. Um, she was making weird noises. She, something wasn't right. Um, there, was a, uh, she, there was an odor, and it wasn't like just unclean person. Like it's a, it, was, it, was, it was like, this is strange. And... Um, we asked about her, and we found out that she'd been sick, and she um, went and sought help from um, a shaman or a witch doctor. And as a result of that interaction with the witch doctor, became oppressed by an evil spirit. She used to be one of the village school teachers, lost her ability to read, write, speak. She could just she could only she could only just make noises. Her, her body was contorted and she would do weird stuff and it was like really uncomfortable. We got to the service that night and um, I don't remember all the details of how it happened but Mr. Martin's standing right there. He'll tell you if I'm lying. Uh, we, 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 uh, we prayed over her, used the authority we have in Jesus' name and that woman instantaneously, like you snap your finger, she was set free. She was able to read, write, talk, speak, all, all of it. Am, am, I, am, I, am I telling the truth? Am I, I'm telling the truth, right? And um, we went back to the village the next day. She was reading her Bible. The, the kids were going to come back, and she was going to be able to, she was a teacher. She was going to be able to teach again because Jesus set her free. Now, when you read this verse, that's certainly what that means. But that isn't all that it means. It means more than that. Here's what Jesus is saying. That the moment you say yes... There will be satanic oppression and opposition to try to keep you from going in the form of these fears, anxieties, insecurities. And those are the first things you have to confront and overcome. There's a passage in Isaiah that I want to finish with, Isaiah chapter 6. And it asks a question that I hope... It, also, it asks a question, then it provides an answer that I hope will be your answer to this very important question. 
Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 says this. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I, the prophet, says, Here am I, send me. Every single person in this room and every person watching online, any person who will hear this message, this is the call for this weekend. There is a need who will go. And what I'm prayerfully asking you to consider, today you may be ready to make an answer, you may need to think about it, but who will go? I believe God in this season in our church is looking for people who are gonna say, here I am, send me, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. Many of you have gone and are goers and many more will and I thank God for that. But I think we have to take this directive seriously if we are going to reach and touch and see transformation in a hurting and dying world. And everywhere when you read these passages, you see these interactions with these evil opposition. In Luke chapter nine, the text talks about something really similar. Let me just read it to you real quickly to just punctuate this. Luke chapter nine, I'm not gonna dive into it, but verse one, it's the original sending of the disciples in Luke chapter nine, verse one. Then he called, him, called his disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Again, you see opposition coming. I wanna say something that is, um, it's not meant to be uh, political, but it maybe has political implications. So I just want you to listen to me for just a moment. I've done, I've, I've tried to say this to you over and over and it bears repeating. Uh, there is no political solution to a spiritual problem. And what our nation right now is facing, this has nothing to do with who is and who isn't in office. I'll just say it plain and make everybody mad. It was messed up when this guy was there and it was messed up when the previous guy was there. It's always gonna be messed up because people were messed up. I know, I know I won't get a clap or an amen out of you if you think Trump is the savior that's coming to save the world. I know I won't get a clap or an amen out of you if you think Biden's the savior of the world, but I don't really care if I get a clap or an amen out of you because Jesus is the only true savior of the world. That's all there is to it. It's just all there is to it. And there, there are, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk plain because I feel led to do this. There are some things happening in this nation that are the result of the church not doing its assignment to pray and walk in the authority it's been given. You can't blame red, you can't blame blue. You got to take responsibility and we've got to take responsibility as the church to use and wield the authority that Jesus has given to us because these things that we're facing are only gonna change by the power of God. That's the only way they're gonna change. And we, part of going means being serious to, to pray and to, to use that authority. And so I'm gonna finish this way because as we go into Zanesville and beyond, it's, it's the enemy just doesn't want the kingdom of God to take ground. And um, I want you to stand with me. I'm gonna finish this way. I just think it'd be good if we just uh, make some declarations of, of faith over our communities and our families and our lives because we have been given authority. I'll get into that as we go on, but I wanna demonstrate how you can do this. Yeah. Father in heaven, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And our desire is to go and to walk in all the fullness that you've planned for us. So Lord, based on the authority you've given to us, not authority that we've endeavored to take or power or position, but not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. We speak to every 
evil spirit that would seek to plant its and sink its claws into our families and into our kids. And we tell you, you've got to, Satan, you've got to let our families go. Satan, you've got to let our kids go. You can't hold on to them anymore. You can't, you can't wield with them with depression and anxiety. You can't, you can't maneuver them with addiction and, and compulsion. Uh, we just take authority over those things. The devil, you got to let those kids go in Jesus' name. You have no right and you have no permission to be in our homes anymore. You have no right and no permission to be over our families anymore. Some of this stuff that our families have been walking through in this church, you have to, those things have to stop right now in Jesus' name. They cannot continue. You do not have permission, Satan, to use your power in this place and over these people in Jesus name in Jesus name devil we tell you you have to take your hands off of our nation and off of its leaders and off of its people we come against any spirit that would seek to divide, especially as we go into this next season and campaign time. We come against any lie, every deception that you want to wield against this nation. And we say God is greater. Greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. Father, I give you thanks that you have heard us, you've authorized us, you've equipped us to go, and those declarations that have been made in accordance and in agreement with your word, they will grow fruit and that fruit will abound and we will begin to see results at the next level. And we give you thanks for equipping us, the church, to wage this warfare. And it's in Jesus' powerful and mighty name we say and pray these things. Amen. 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 Amen.